have Pastor Joseph back with from the youth going to camp, amen, so I know he's rested up and excited, but all good, huh? We, it's a kind of a joke as you get older, especially if you were ever in youth ministry, you always feel like you served your time, but uh, uh, I, I really believe this, when I, I left youth ministry and after four years and I was an evangelist for three years and I became a pastor, I felt like I stepped down. I really loved working with teenagers. It was a, a joy for me. I loved evangelism, and I've loved pastoring, so, uh, but it took me a little while to get a little grip with pastoring. I, if you don't know, uh, my first service as a pastor, we had 50 people. The next service was around 30. The next one was around 20. We had a tremendous start. <laughs> you know what made it work is uh, tenacity. Never giving up. Keep pounding. Keep believing. Amen. Watching what the Lord does. And so now... Uh, be, be 30 years coming up here pretty soon. So it's an, been an amazing run. Thank God to stay with it. Uh, this morning, I want to preach to you about a young lady, and it's going to take me a while to get to her. But one reason why is, as we did the midweek services, I realized that a lot of folk watched online or, or something because we didn't have as uh, many people as I normally think we should have on Tuesday and Wednesday. So I said, you know what, I'm going I'm to reshare this again, some of this on Sunday, because I believe you need it. Everybody say, I need it. Yeah. Cooked a good meal on, on midweek, and you weren't here to eat it, so we're going to serve it again as a casserole. Can I get an amen? Amen. So we're going to serve it one more time. But I think it's so important to catch some of this because it's life-changing. These thoughts are life-changing thoughts I want to give you today. So I want you to pay close attention. Uh, one of the things I realized as a nation, things shifted a little over a month ago when our Supreme Court knocked down something that was uh, 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 not a righteous thing in 1973. People are griping right now about it, but you, know, you forgot 1973. We griped about it, and that was when Roe v. Wade was flipped, and that's a powerful thing. The Supreme Court did that. Judges did that. So I went back in the book of Judges, and I started realizing that, that the power doesn't lay in the president and a lot of even the, the Congress as much as it does among the judges. Amen. Even our local judges are so important. I have friends that are local judges. Don't ask me how, but I do. Amen. And I've made friends, and I've learned where to make friends. But three, three things I learned through the Old Testament is this. The Old Testament was written as an example for us. And here are three things I learned. War is all about this thing. Man, there's so much war going on and, and so many things happening. But when God told um, Moses to lead the children out into the promised land, it was a promise that he'd given to Abraham, this land belongs to you. Now, that land had squatters in it known as ites, you know, the Philistines, and then you had the Amorites, the the Gergeshites, and it's just a truckload of ites in the land. And so they had to drive them out after they moved into Jericho, and they, they kept moving into uh, other places. They kept driving them out. That's the book of Joshua. Then you hit the book of Judges. There's 12, 12 judges in the book of Judges. And we, we broke them down, but we, were, we found out one thing. They had to keep going into war. They had to keep fighting to drive out the ites. The, we're going to talk about the Canaanites some today. But three things we knew about war. First, it's unavoidable, it's untimely, and it's often unequal. I mentioned to you about Satan. He's had 5,000 years of known practice to try to deceive people. 5,000 known years that we know of. Amen. I know you want to talk about millions, all that, but we can't find people millions all right, 5,000 years of known history. Let me say it that way. Amen. That, that way I don't get called out. Because of that, he's only used the same tricks over and over. The Scripture says we're aware of his schemes. We understand about gossip and criticism, backbody. We understand about the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. We walk through that, and we pick up on it, and these are the things we fight against. So our biggest battle is often the, our enemy is in a me. Catch that. Our enemy is in a me. It's inside here. We always fight what's going on in our mind and what it gets down in our heart. So it's often unequal, always untimely. It never happens when you're ready. If you have your dukes up all the time, you're ready for the fight. But to get blindsided, to get hit, it's always untimely. It, it, it was like, where did that come from? You know, we went through Hurricane Harvey. It was untimely. Then, then we hit uh, Amelda. It was untimely. But some folks forgot we had a freeze, too. How I many of those folks weren't ready for the freeze? I ain't got no propane in the tank, man. I can't cook anything. Water's busted, pipes everywhere. It was a mess down here in South Texas and around other places. It was untimely. We, we weren't ready for it. By the way, the truth of the matter is, you ain't never ready for it unless you know to be prepared. Then you've got your pipes wrapped, you've got your building raised, you've got your stuff put up. Amen. That, that's when you're ready. But we don't live that way. 
Amen. We kind of casually, and then when it happens, we rush into the grocery store and buy bread and milk to put it in refrigerators that are going to go off. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's unavoidable. You're going to have to fight. Eventually, you're going to have to fight. You've got to realize you're in a spiritual war. 1 Peter 5, 8 says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walks about seeking whom he may devour. You know, with this, uh, this week, we had the Highland shooting, Highland Park shooting, where a, a young demonic, I mean, why, why, don't we, why, don't, why can't we say it? Demon-filled boy, amen, full of the devil, shows up and just starts shooting people indiscriminately. What that did, it caused terror. Just like in 9-11, it caused terror. Amen. People became terrorized. Our church is packed out after 9-11. You realize that, don't you? I mean, we were full to the brim. Every, every church I know of was full. But then after a while, people began to drift away again. We talked about that drifting a couple of weeks ago. People come in because they're scared, man. They don't want to go to hell. They don't want, they want to make sure they cry out to God. So they packed into churches. But then when everything got easy again, Amen. Folks started drifting out. Amen. And started staying that way. Well, what happened with terrorism? Terrorism does three things to a nation. First, it intimidates the population. You realize at that moment, you're intimidated. Uh, before, you were the big bad guys. We were America. Amen. Nobody messed with us. But then all of a sudden, some planes started flying into our buildings, and, and we realized we were susceptible, and, and, and we had to rise up and start doing a few things. Had to start singing a couple of Toby Keith songs. Can I get an amen? Had to get our brave back. Had to get our courage on. Things started shifting in us, but it intimidated the population. Second thing it did, it changed the mode of living, thereby keeping you uh, living in suspense. Uh, we, we went, then, of course, the third one is, is it influenced the government. The, but that second one, we had TSA. You remember getting on a plane with a knife. I do. I always had knives on me. Amen. Uh, you get on the plane, you get up in the air, light come on, everybody in the back starts smoking cigarettes. Amen. Smoke. And that's the funniest thing. We'll put them in the back. You think it mattered? Man, that fuselage was full of smoke by the time we landed. You know, it was just like, but this is the way we live. We just rushed into the airport, got on the go. But after 9-11, it changed everything. Now you got to go get screened. You got to take off your shoes, your belt. You got to go through all this stuff. You got to check you out under your arms. Hey, Amen. They, they, they just work it on you as much as they can. And it's intimidating. And it intimidated our population. As a matter of fact, many people said, quit stereotyping, folk. Are you kidding? As soon as I got on the plane, I looked for anybody that had a towel wrapped around their head. I didn't make no bones about it. Amen. I had my eye on them the whole time. I wasn't trying to be mean, but I was learning something about terrorists. Amen. Trying to pick up on things. So this is the way we, I know that was offensive to some of you because we're not supposed to stereotype, but you know you do it all the time. You just won't say it. You just won't say it. It's okay. I will say what you can't say. I'll take the heat. So it changed our mode of living, and it intimidated our, our government. That's what terrorism does. It did it in that little town of Highland Park. People are afraid to come outside now. They don't want to do a parade again. That, that PTSD, that thing's real. When people have guns that go off around them, thing went off in, uh, in Las Vegas with the um, uh, Jason Aldean concert. Amen. A guy just started shooting through the windows. Uh, it, it affected people. Don't want to go outside. Don't want to go to the concerts. Don't want to get back out again. That's what terrorism does. It, that's, that's, that's satanic. It shuts you down. Amen. It closes you down. And it, it's happened all through Scripture. It's still happening today. But there's an issue that goes on. Whatever you've been taught, and I taught people this for years, Frank, I, over and over again. I taught people they were sheep because that's what I was taught. When I was in college, I was taught that I'm, a, I'm going to be a shepherd and the people are going to be sheep. Amen. We're going to take that right out of the Bible. That's what the Bible teaches. So I taught on a shepherd, uh, uh, looks at the 23rd Psalm. Amen. I walked through that and I told everybody, y'all sheep. Everybody's sheep. I'm the shepherd. Makes me be the big guy. I'm the under shepherd. The big shepherd, under shepherd, and y'all the sheep. And you know, pastors, I don't mean this mean, and I don't say a lot about pastors. I love pastors. But if you're not careful, pastors love to pastor sheep. Because sheep don't give you no trouble. Sheep will hang out. Matter of fact, every now and then you got to go run after one and bring it back to the 99. But basically, sheep got their head down. They graze where you tell them to graze. They move from pasture to pasture. And, and they, they're scared of everything. They got to run to the shepherd for help. That is one distinct nature of a child of God the Bible talks about. We start out as sheep. As a matter of fact, when I'm reading the scripture, Peter reinforced it in the New Testament. He says, You are continually straying. Like sheep. You left 
the flock like sheep. Now you've returned. We're reminded that Jesus being the great shepherd. When Jesus addressed Simon Peter in John 21 after the resurrection, he told Peter, feed my sheep. But he talked about a progression of sheep. Or those that were growing older are getting smarter or wiser. He said in John 10, 27, his sheep know his voice. We understand that. When you start out and you get born again, as believers, you're sheep. Amen. You need to listen. You need to grace. You need to pay attention. But you got to grow. And I told my pastor today, I said, all I did was teach people that I get to do all the work and they just get to be sheep. That's what I taught. But then there's a second nature in the Bible that, that just absolutely blows everything out of the water. It's what Peter became. It's what John became. It's what James became before he was beheaded. It's what little Stephen, 16 years old, became. They weren't acting like sheep no more. They took on that second mature nature known as a lion. Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah. We just read where Satan goes about like a lion, but he's like a lion. Jesus is a lion. When he comes back, he comes back as the lion of the tribe of Judah. So the Word of God teaches me that a tribe has to be indicative of what leads it. If a tribe is being led by a lion, guess what the tribe is? Got to be lions, man. Amen. So I'm walking through Scripture, and I'm picking up on it, and I'm seeing that there has to be a moment when you say enough is enough, and the lion takes over. You know, you have to begin to declare, even within your heart, God, I know the church is real. I know you put me here. That your nature shift. Culture begins to shift. People begin to think different. See, our problem is, is we have cuddled, and we have coddled, People for so long, we've been pampered and nurtured forever. So the voice of God begins to roar in the earth and asking, where's the lions? Where are the people going to rise up? And I've watched this church. This is 2005 when this revelation hit me and Pastor David Hilton. We were together with Miles Monroe in Tulsa, Oklahoma at a church which is now known as Transformation Church. Amen. And there, that thing hit us like, I mean, just like slapped me in the face. And I said, that's it. That's the whole deal. I've been telling people they sheep, and they never were sheep. We never acted like sheep. We were always building. We were always going. We were always growing. Amen. We, we never backed off from a fight. We were always in a fight. So why we, they, they're like sheep with teeth. Amen. So I, mean, I got to tell them the truth now. So I said, in 05, I started telling folk, man, you're not a sheep, you're lying. you made to take dominion. Sheep never take dominion over anything. Sheep never own their own stuff. Sheep never get up out of the bed. Sheep, sheep just stay. But a lion, a lion, my friend, will own their own business. A lion will step out and say, I can do a little bit better with this than my health is. A lion will get up and say, you know what? I'm not just going to passively move through life with my children, let them do whatever the blank they want. Amen. I'm going to try to give them some boundaries now and help them out. And if I don't do it for them, my God, help me do it for my grandkids. Yeah. Amen. what lions do. Those lions have a different attitude. They don't get pushed around. you, you got to remember, they're, they're territorial. I'm going to walk through this fast. They're territorial. Lions will mark their territory. I know it may sound a little vulgar, but that lion will lift his leg and he will spray something and say, that's mine. I turn my big dog loose, Miss Donna. As soon as he gets outside, that dog is going to wet on everything on that property. Coda says, this property belongs to me. I promise. I, I know he's got to run out in a minute. But he knows how big that property is and just how much squirt he can squirt on each thing he hits. Amen. He's going to go all the way around that, that, that 110 acres. He's going to make sure that every bit of that property is his. Amen. He's going to mark it. I taught my boys to mark their property. Come on, give me the amen. amen. You know what I'm saying? If I'm going hunting, I'm marking stuff. Hallelujah. A lion is not a victim. The lion has a keen sense of smell. They can locate their prey. They can find their, their, their enemy, anything trying to rob their purpose. He, the full growth of the lion's mane represents their majesty, maturity. God doesn't want you to stay just as a believer. He wants you to be disciple, to be like Christ as a Christian. Inherent vision. And yes, I'll say it again. When you got born again, you were not a Christian. You are not like Christ. The, the Spirit of Christ was in you, yes, but it's going to take a while for you, all of us, to be like Jesus. Can you get an amen? amen? But they got inherent vision. And one study said that lions are born with their eyes open. They have night vision. They're able to see what others can't see. They have acute hearing. They're able to hear still small voices. They can detect the enemy. Our enemy acts as a terrorist. Satan has always acted as a terrorist. He, he's not big enough or bold enough to come right out and fight you, but he'll roar. He'll roar like a lion. And he'll try to scare you. He'll put phobias into your life. Amen. He'll keep you locked down. He'll make you, he'll keep, some of you are rejoicing over gas, hitting $4 a gallon now. I've watched you. Oh, man, it's four bucks. <laughs> yeah, okay, I'm waiting on that $2 one again. Cha-ching. 
I'll go further than that. I remember 75 cents a gallon. Amen. But thank God for the electric cars that are coming because we're going to really be able to tax those things and get money. Uh, you catch, I hope y'all watch what's going on. What's needed is a spirit of leadership. That defining moment, it inspires others to have hope in the face of great odds. We're always looking for a leader like this that will give us hope. Amen. Uh, and because of that, the leader to cultivate a spirit of purpose, to give people purpose, uh, show them a purpose, daring, passion, conviction. Those leaders were known as judges. They are found in the book of Judges. We've walked through a couple of them. We talked about Gideon last Sunday. Amen. And how 300 uh, crackpots and lights on a hill changed everything. We worked through it. And I just want to reflect a few things. Everybody say reflection. So you get to Judges 5. You get to Judges 5. Deborah. They begin to sing. Deborah, of course, we're going to talk about it in a little bit. But Deborah, they, they begin to sing. And they begin to sing about what the Lord has done. I love that Cajun song. It said, look what the Lord done did. Amen. He, he touched my body. He saved my mind. Uh, he, said, he touched my mind. He touched my mind. Something like that. He saved me. It was just in time. Oh, yeah, I love that song. And you got to remind yourself what the Lord did. And that's what Deborah does here. She said that day, Deborah and Barak, son of uh, Abinam, and I'm going, to miss, I'm going to skip over some of the big names. You can read it on over here, sang this song. This is, again, reflection. They're looking back. When they let down their hair in Israel, they let it blow wild in the wind. The people uh, volunteered with abandon. Bless God. Hear, O kings, listen, O princess, or to God, yes, to God. I'll sing. I'll make music to God, to the God of Israel. God. You, you left Seir. You marched across the fields of Edom. Earth quaked. Yes, the skies poured rain. Oh, the clouds made rivers. Mountains leaped before God, the Sinai God, before God, the God of Israel. In the, name, in the time of Shamgar, son of Anath, and in the time of Jael, <laughs> public roads were abandoned. Travelers went by the back roads, out through the bushes. Warriors became fat and sloppy. No fight left in them. I'll just say they acted like sheep. Then you, Deborah, rose up. You got up, a mother in Israel. God chose new leaders who then fought at the gates and not a shield or a spear to be seen among the 40 companies of Israel. Lift your hearts high, O Israel. I mean, she gave, she gave God praise for what just happened. With abandon, volunteering yourself with the people. Bless God. You who ride on prized donkeys, comfortably mounted on blankets, and you who walk down the roads, ponder, attend, gather at the town well and listen to them sing, chanting the tale of God's victories, his victories accomplished in Israel. Then the people of God went down to the city gates. Uh, when you read this scripture, you see a reflection first of how bad Israel was, what kind of condition they were in. Amen. It, it, was, it was in a bad way. Uh, and, and we get to that in just a minute. But as we walk through Judges, we find Israel in trouble. They drove out to drive, trying to drive out the enemy. They cried for a leader. Give us a leader, God. God gave him a leader. Gave a man named Ehud. Ehud was a man. He had left hand. He's a left hand dagger bearer. Amen. He went in before the king Elon. He dropped the knife out of his sleeve and shoved it up to the hilt of the knife. As far as he could get it, uh, would say it again, that Elon was probably a little bit pudgy. Amen. So he took him out. Israel has peace. This judge starts taking over things, and then he passes away. Amen. After, that, after the deliverance came from him, then comes a man named Shamgar. Shamgar's a farmer. He's not a warrior. Talked about him during the midweek. Going to say it again to you. There's only two verses dedicated to this third judge who ruled Israel under Philistine tyranny. The highways, our highways are our life source. If 2100 is shut down, you've got to start scrambling down all these little side roads. Amen. When there's no life source there, you can't get to where you're trying to go. Their life source was shut down. The main road was shut down. As a matter of fact, they didn't even have the little tributaries like we do today. They had to run through the bushes. They had to go through the backwoods, if you would, if you know what I'm saying. So the highways were shut down. They were cut off by, by the uh, Philistines. And so the Israelites had to go through other ways. So there, they're living like sheep. They're living in terrorism. Amen. That their mode of travel has shut down. Judges 5, 6 says, in the days of Shamgar, we just read it, son of Anath, in the days of Jael, the roads were abandoned. Travelers took to winding paths. Judges 3 31, after Ehud came, Shamgar, son of Anath, who struck down 600 Philistines with an ox goat, he too saved Israel. How, how, how do you get there? First, you got to get fed up. Have you ever been fed up? Are you fed up with what's going on today? 
Are you fed up with your own spiritual life? Let's talk about just you person. Are you fed up with your own spiritual life? you got to get in a place where you just get fed up. Amen. And once you get fed up, that's what Shamgar did. Amen. He just got fed up in, in this situation. He's mad about it. The Philistines were possessing what belonged to his people. And I can tell you this. There are times in your life the devil or, or whatever you want to call it has taken stuff that belongs to you. He took your joy away. He took your peace away. You used to be a loving person, but all of a sudden now you are unforgiven. He took all the good attributes you could have as a believer away. Time to get it back. Come on. Took your boldness away. You're like a little, you're like a little sheep. Meh, meh, meh. Amen. Scared to talk about Christ in front of anyone. Your boldness has left you. Oh, my goodness. God, help us rise up. So there had to be something. Shamgar got tired of it. He got tired of walking through that snake infested and muddy when it rains, hot when it doesn't woods. He's fed up. He's tired of getting chiggers on him. He's tired of pulling ticks off of him. He's tired. I'm going back down the road. His solution was his attitude. Enough is enough. Again, your attitude's going to come out your mouth. Imagine Shamgar. He just said, I, I can't take it. He grabs up his stick. He ain't got a gun. He ain't got a bow. He ain't got a sword. He ain't got a shield. He grabs what he knows. Amen. He uses what he knows. Let me say this to you. What you work with is what you win with. What you work with is what you win with. So he grabs up that stick, man, and he starts heading down. And the Bible records he took out 600 Philistines and regained the road and became the judge over Israel. Amen. I'm going to tell you what happened with him. He got, he got fed up. And then he got filled up with hope. He believed he could do it. He believed he could do it. you got to have hope. Without hope, you're not going to make it. One young lady wrote me this week, amen, and uh, she's attended our church. and She's another one that's fighting cancer. And, and she said, Pastor, I wish, she lives in Tennessee, I wish we could find a church like a little country church. You guys welcomed us in as I'm struggling with cancer. I'm going, but now I'm back home. Hope to see you again. She said, always, you know what I told her? I said, find a voice. Find a voice that speaks hope and peace. Amen. And find, then that's your church. But you've got to find a voice that will tell that to you. Amen. You've got to have hope for that which is now and for that which is to come. Can I get an amen? Let me tell you, the Philistines failed to reckon with a man who had had enough and who had a God who would stand behind him with a roar inside of him. I can see Shamgar hitting that door. <laughs> amen. That roar comes out. I've tried to roar, but if I do, I won't be able to preach next service. But he, he roars. He goes out the door, Kenny, and he's tapping that stick on the ground. This you know what this is? This is walking tall right here, my friend. Hey, Amen. He, he tapping that stick on the ground. He Buford Pusser right now. Uh, Y'all don't remember Buford. Hey, Amen. He tapping that ground, and he's saying, come on, get it, boys. Hey, Amen. And, and then the Bible says in Judges 4, 3, the children of Israel cried unto the Lord. Every time this happened, God blessed them. So here we have a need. It's been, matter of fact, if I look at this correctly, it's been 20 years. Can I be honest? Four years, we struggle. If we get the wrong leader for four years, we struggle. We bicker, we fight, we get upset, churches split, folk talk about things. Four years. Twenty years has gone by. Shamgar is dead. Now the Philistine, excuse me, the Canaanite ruler has taken over. So he's running things for 20 years. And then the Bible says, the children of Israel, chapter 4, verse 3, the children of Israel cried unto the Lord. <clears throat> How long is it going to take us to cry? When do we start roaring? When do we start, not just to uh, old Facebook or Instagram, when do we start telling God, Lord, help us. Let a lion rise up. Let leaders rise up. Let people, let judges give us a place in this land that we can feel free again to serve you, to love you. When do we rise up? And that's what they did. And when they did, this time, However, history was about to be made. Watch this. This time, God is not going to call a man out to roar. This time, he's not going to look among the troops of the masculine. Hallelujah. This time, God raises up a daughter. He picks out a woman. Amen. Brings up a woman of God. As she comes up, she said, I, Deborah, arose, the mother in Israel. See, verse 7 says, the inhabitants of the villages, they ceased. They ceased in Israel. That word ceased in the Hebrew means to desist, to be lacking, to, be, to put it in idle. They just sat in, 20 years they had idle. They failed. They were unoccupied. The message Bible says the warriors became fat and sloppy. Mm, didn't cut no corner. Fat and sloppy. No fight left in them. In essence, the people were so oppressed, they lost the joy of living. Now, I don't see that happening among a large group, but every now and then I see individuals start losing their joy. 
Amen. Uh, the, the desire to live, to go on. Yeah, yes, a, a spouse passed on. Uh, a child was, da- was in danger. The uh, economy's starting to slip. And you start beginning to focus on that instead of on him. And your joy starts slipping away from you. And that's what happened to these folks. Village life, the scripture says, which means the warriors could read. The warriors in Israel were unoccupied or they avoided action. Now, I I love militancy. You know that, guys. I'm a little bit on the edge when it comes to that. But I I don't want to drive a church out in the middle of the streets and blocking streets or anything. That's not. But my prayer is that you start praying and that you rise up and you call on the name of God. Of God, and as you call on Christ, Amen. Things start changing. I don't mind you getting Milton, Amen. I just don't know if I got enough bell money for you all of you, Amen. That's why sometimes it's better for the leader to go instead of everyone. So in essence, the people were so oppressed they lost the joy. They needed a leader to deliver them. Let me tell you something. When you need a leader to deliver you, you need Mama. <laughs> I was just gonna say as honest as I can. Mama can get you out of more messes than anybody. My daddy couldn't get me out of a lot of messes, but I'll tell you something, Mama got me out. Mama helped me through a whole lot of stuff. Yeah, I know a lot of times we don't, my mom and I don't talk a lot about it, but I believe my mama was a praying woman before praying was popular among women. Amen. She didn't even go to church, man. She wasn't in church, but she knew she needed some higher power to help her out to deal with her sons. Amen. So she started praying. And that's what mama do. The people that lived in villages, they moved to walled cities. They moved out of that kind of protection because of the terrorism. Village life, amen, it began to cease. But here we find that God began. Anytime God, the people called on God, he raised up leaders in the time of fear. Jonathan, David, Gideon. He would just do that. In this text, what was needed was a woman. They ceased in Israel until I, Deborah, arose. The Message Bible says, then you, Deborah, rose up. You got up, a mother in Israel. Her credentials, she was a prophet. She was a judge. She was a military leader. She's the only woman to ever carry those three distinct areas. Her character, when she rose up, the the Scripture, if you study the book of, uh, not the book, I just looked it up. Sometimes... Our phones are so easy. So I just duck, duck, gold it. Where Deborah, her name means be. Be careful what you name things. Amen. Be careful what you name things. I had a friend get thrown off of a one eyed horse named Twister. Be careful what you name things. Amen. Sometimes you get something, name one thing, change the name. Hallelujah. Her name meant be. That's what her name. Did you know the scripture says in the book of Deuteronomy 7, 20, God spoke to Moses. He said, I'm going to tell you. He said, how are we going to, how are we going to get the, the, the enemy out of the land? How are we going to get the enemy out of the land? I love the scripture. It says, moreover, the Lord thy God will send the hornet among them until they that are left and hide themselves from thee be destroyed. I tell you how I'm going to drive them out. I'm going to drive them out with a bee. I have never, ever seen anybody when bees were after them just stand there. Look, you're talking about terrorism. <laughs> you know, when a bee gets after you, you go. You move. Amen. You don't stand there. Uh, uh, my, my dad would be out brush hogging. My son, my son, my brother, ran right up next to him. He started talking to him. Hey, Dad. And he hit a nest of yellow jackets. All of a sudden, my brother did a dance I have never seen before nor like since. Amen. He danced all over that field. Them yellow jackets were tied up in his socks. They were popping him. And, and, and after it was over, got them all off. My dad, you have to know where I'm from. Uh, uh, Jimmy went to him. He's crying. He said, Dad, Bob, what I do? He said, go see Granny. My Granny lived in a log cabin, a true log cabin right down in front of us. Amen. Had a well, drew water up. Had, had her bathroom was a commode lid on top of a chair and a peapot underneath it. Amen. Which I still have to this day. Praise the Lord. Sterilized. So, so dad sent him down there. Jimmy go down there. Them bee stings all over him. And granny had that brute and snuff in her mouth. Man, if, if, if monkey's blood and snuff couldn't heal you, you can't get well. God help us. We take his COVID out in a minute if granny start dipping again. And she'd take that snuff and she'd put it all over him. He'd come back up the house. He had brown spots all over him. But it drew that poison out. Amen. And all of it started going down again. A bee. And bees, you run for them. He said, I'm going to send a hornet. And who knew that the hornet was going to be a queen bee? 
and her name was Deborah. She rose. The leader of the bee family is always female. She's known as the queen bee. She's the only female that's fertile. Her responsibilities included building a home, selecting a home site, feeding the young, and defending the family. She's, she's a bad bee, I'm telling you. Amen. What do you drive, Pastor? A super bee. Come on, stay with me right here. She does not leave her nest until she dies. She can lay up to 2,000 eggs a day. The dance. She will put on a dance. I was on the tower this week, and I did that Elvis thing. J.J. was up there singing, Viva Las Vegas. Amen. Sometimes you just got to dance. Amen. Can I get an amen? I know you men ain't going to do that. You're going to do it privately. But every now and then, it just shows up. The dance, we're notifying the others in the hive of a new source of food. She will perform a dance by vibrating her wings and moving her body around. The dance communicates how far and in what direction the food is in. The speed of the dance and the length of the dance communicates. See, she gets it from the, the, the worker bees. They tell her, and then she goes to communicating what she's heard, what's going on outside there, and she tells them, amen, and she starts speeding up, and they realize if, that, if, it's, if it's a slow, then, then it's going to be easy. If it's fast, then it's going to be a difficult flight. If it's uphill, downhill, against the wind, how much energy I'm going to need to get there. She communicates everything to them. I think that it's so important learning to communicate to talk to tell this is how I, I want you to do this thing if the amount of food there is great the dance lasts longer and it's more enthusiastic aren't you the same way walking into salt grass <laughs> amen don't you know your good food to get you fired up Amen. It'll bless you. Hallelujah. It spiritually ought to be the same way. You ought to come to church knowing you're going to get some spiritual food and you get your dance on. Can I get an amen? Amen. Sometimes I got to look for the queen beast. Just give me an amen on that. Hallelujah. Amen. Mom, listen to me. It might be time to dance. Mama, it might be time to dance. You can watch a mama. You can watch a mama. And she'll tell you how far you can go and when you can go. <laughs> Daddy, it's funny. My kids always say, they, they, Mama, they, they come to me first. You know, that's not true. They come to me second because they think I'm going to agree. But, but the smartest thing you'll ever learn as a husband and a father is what did your mama say? Amen. It stand with what mama said. Amen. Agree with mama. What mama say? Amen. Because I'm going to tell you, the times that I went to my dad, he said, when mama say, now I'm in trouble. Amen. I'm in trouble because I'm trying to manipulate a situation here. But mama's already given me a green light. She arose. She made a move. Like Ehud, she made a move. Like Shamgar, she made a move. Like Gideon, she made a move. Amen. She rose. She didn't wait to be selected. She rose. She didn't wait for someone to choose her. She rose. She saw a need, and she rose to the occasion. Before she got up, Judges chapter 4, verse 4. Now we're going to back up and see what she did. Deborah was a prophet. A wife of. She was, she was the judge over Israel at the time. She held court under Deborah's palm. Come on up, Joseph, if you would. She held court under, uh, under Deborah's palm between Ramah and Bethel. Bethel meaning the house of God in the hills of Ephraim. The people of Israel went to her in the matters of justice. She sent for Barak, son of Abinam, from Kadesh and Naphtali. And she said to him, it has become clear that God, the God of Israel, commands you, go to Mount Tabor and prepare for battle. Take ten companies of soldiers from these two places, and I'll I'll take care of getting Sisera. Now listen, Sisera, however you want to say his name, he was the leader of a great army that had 900, 900 iron chariots. Fear when this man's name was mentioned because he's the main guy. Amen. And Deborah knew it. So as a judge, and they're feeling the tyranny of the Canaanite people on top of them, she gets Barak, and she brings a man. She's smart. She brings a man in, a general. But he loves this woman to the point of respects her as Queen Bee. He knows that her judgments have been right. And she's heard a word. She's a prophet. She's heard a word from God. Enough is enough. Again, that Pi syndrome. I've had all I can stand, and I can't stand no more. Amen. And she rose. She got up, amen, and she began to speak. She said, I'll take care of Sisera, the leader of Jabin's army, to the Kishon River with all his chariots and troops, and I'll make sure you win the battle. Barak said, if you go with me, I'll go. 
But if you don't go with me, I won't go. And Deborah rose, and she went with him. And the battle ensued. And God caused, like he did for Shamgar, like he did for Gideon, he moved upon the, the men of Israel who rose up against this great army, and they destroyed this army. And as a matter of fact, the army turned on themselves. And then Sisera, he's running for his life, and he makes it near a tent. And there outside the tent is Jael, J-A-E-L, Jael. She married a woman, and Sisera is wore out. He's the leader of the army, and he says to her, hey, hey, see, Deborah does set all this up. Sometimes you just got to set things up. And she set it up. And she, he runs through the tent. He's fatigued. He said, bring me water. She's a smart woman. She got him milk. You know what milk do to an already tired man? <sighs> Put him out like a light. He laid down. And then she walked over like a lioness and grabs a tent peg and a mallet. And sets it on that commander's temple and drives it all the way through his head into the ground. Barak, after routing the army, is looking for the commander. He shows up, and there is Jael outside the tent. And he said, has anybody seen Sisera? And she said, yes, sir. Uh, he's laying down in here. <laughs> A great victory because I, Deborah, rose, a mother in Israel. The Scripture never records that she has children. Never records she got kids, but she got children. She looked at all the children of Israel as her children. Amen. She protected all of them. She rose up. Amen. Let me just tell you, your roar will clear your road, defeat your enemies, I talk about praise a lot in this house because I believe in it. There are times I just want to roar. I, I can't be quiet. I got to say something. And, sir, if you are the type that feels uncomfortable that, get on your Harley or get in your workshop or get in your deer stand, get somewhere and give God some praise and give him a roar and remind yourself, you know, I'm not a sheep. That was my nature. But my nature has shifted. I understand now I'm a lion, amen, from the tribe of Judah. So what I'm telling you today is get fed up. Just get fed up. Get filled up. And please, keep, keep the wood on. Keep fired up. Amen. Keep fired. You don't like being around fired up people. Amen. Keith ain't nothing like it, is it? Get around folks that are fired up for God. They want to do something for God. They want to talk about God. Listen, Wednesday night, I invited the two bishop Mormons that were at our church, the LDSs is what they like to be called, the Latter-day Saints. I said, will you guys come to church? You know what they said? Yeah, we'll come. And they came and sat on the front row. One of them is from Samoa. He's an islander. Amen. And uh, his name was Cool. That was his initials. I couldn't say his name, so we made up. That was it, Cool. And he had on his island kilt. And they listened to me preach about lions and sheep. They took T-shirts from our church to advertise the camp and the church. Then they said, asked me and David to come to their service, and I did. We both walked in and listened to these men. Amen. They honored us and back and forth. I told my pastor after listening, and I'm sure as you get into the involved in the LDS, it might get a little weirder as it gets, but I heard them talking about Jesus and the atonement. And I said to myself, something's shifting in the world. There are more people now talking about Jesus than what we realize. There are more groups talking about Jesus more than we realize. And Paul said, as long as they're talking about Christ, leave them alone. See, I'm not, I can't change preachers. I, ain't, I can't even change you. I'm still struggling with Jerry. So it's important to understand that, that in our lives, I can't change them, but I can influence them. And after, after they left on, on Friday, I spent a little more time with one of them, one of the bishops from Samoa. He was so thankful. He wanted to know more about our church, the way we do things, the way we operate. And, and you could just see something igniting inside of him. Church, you're not Millie Miles. You're not Weaklings. 
you got a great God living inside of you. Amen. Sister, 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 mama, aunt, sister, daughter. Man, God has so much invested in you. Don't sit around and think you can't, because you can. And when others won't rise, you better get up. I believe in mama in this house. Amen. My mamas in this house have prayed and sustained me through many years. My sisters have supported me. Amen. I thank God for this house. Amen. Heads bowed, eyes closed for a moment. Spirit of God, you came upon Gideon. Spirit of God, you came upon Ehud. You moved upon Samson. You moved over Shamgar. You moved over Deborah. Let the lion and the lioness rise in this house. I speak over their lives, and I, I thank you in the name of Jesus that things are going to shift, their nature is going to shift. They're going to start thinking different. When they read the Bible, it ain't going to be to a sheep no more, but it's coming into a lion. God, change our attitude, our mentalities. Make us more like you. Put the roar back in the house. Save this nation in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Come on, give God praise. Amen. I'll get it directly. Okay. Uh, if, real quickly, if our servant leaders come up. Mm -hmm. How many learned something today? Amen. You learned something today? I believe you did. Sheep wouldn't wear a shirt like that. Uh-uh. You're not a sheep. That's right. Listen, the Bible says these men came to David. I want to thank them from Manasseh somewhere, but they came to David while he was in the cave. <coughs> And when he saw them, the Scripture said they had faces like lions. Their faces were like lions. And he looked at them, and David said, you're for me or against me? And they said, we're for you, sir. Because he said, if you're against me, then i gotta, I got to deal with you right now. See, when I study the life of King David, I see a lion. I see a man who had no, had no miracles. Can't find one single miracle. I see him in, in Abraham's life, Moses' life. I, I've seen it in Joshua's life. Elisha's life, Elijah's life, da David, I don't see one miracle. We say, well, hey, what about Goliath? Goliath was skilled. Goliath was skilled. So I don't see no miracles in David's life. And yet he had a passion for God, and he had a heart like a lion. Amen. And, that, and it may be the softness has got to be on the inside, but there's got to be something to rise up in all of us and help us realize we, we don't have to let. Listen, you ain't got to let people run over you either. And as a lion, it's not for you to control other people. But you don't have to be run over either. Amen. I've met Christians, quote, unquote, that say, well, you know, I just got to be a pacifist. I just got to lay around. I got to let them run over me. Uh, look, I have allowed, I'll say it again, I have allowed certain people that I love run over me because I love them. And I will love them to the day I die. And I've allowed them to do things that I would never allow anybody else because I love them. There are times that you've got to allow people. Your, your love will limit you. Let me just say, uh, limit your liberty by your love. So I love. I love deeply. But there's certain folk that have no right in your life that's trying to run over you. Amen. Stand your ground. Can I get an amen? Amen. You got your offering ready? As we give today, we believe in God for jobs and better jobs. More money, less hours, benefits, sales and commission, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, finding money, bills paid off, settlements, inheritance, rebates and returns, debts demolished, royalties received, favor and success to the kingdom. You that are watching online right now, make sure you go to holywild.net slash give and give to the Little Country Church Camp Holy Wild. We thank you for your support. Amen. Now welcome Pastor David Cloward. All right, give it up for your pastor.